There are some days that you just want to throw away. If you have the option on the calendar to skip, just rip it off the calendar and throw it away before that day began because of the trouble and the difficulty that you have. Now, in Seventh-day Baptist land, we had one of those days this week when we heard about the death of our friend from Brazil, Jonah Summer, and his family um, who were killed in a car accident. And uh, if you don't know Jonas, Jonas uh, was the president of the Seventh-day Baptist Conference there in Brazil, and he was a tremendous leader and a tremendous friend of uh, many in our congregation as well as uh, Seventh-day Baptists in the United States. So it would have been nice to just rip that date off the calendar this past week and to not have it happen. On days like that, it's kind of hard to believe that God's holding everything together. Sometimes it's just it's pretty tough. And then, and then someone says a few words to you that are like a beam of sunshine. You remember those Chilean miners down underneath? Like a beam of sunshine that, that just breaks through the surface. They're like a life preserver for someone caught in a riptide. They're like a cold drink of water on the hottest day of summer. And everything changes. And life seems like it's worth the effort once again. Now, although we might not realize it at the time, the words that God gave to us in the book that we call the Bible are the words that change everything. They are the words that bring light into the dark places in our lives. In the Bible, we have good news. We have the best news ever. The Bible calls it the gospel. And the gospel is God's message to human beings trapped in a dark place with no way out and no hope of rescue. This is the, the good news, the message that he brings to us through the words of Scripture. We who have received the gospel of Christ, we have a high calling. We're not only called to know the gospel, but also to fully understand it. And then as we fully understand it, we are given the greatest honor that can be given to a human being, and that is the privilege of being able to share the good news with those whom God brings into our lives. Now, the angels don't have that privilege. The angels don't have that privilege, but God, in His wisdom, has given us that honor, that glory, that privilege of being able to share the news that changes everything, uh, changes a person's eternity. And this honor is not reserved for certain people. It's open to everyone who has received and believed the gospel. If you've received the gospel of Christ and you believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are open to having that honor as well. You don't have to have any special qualifications. There's no degree that you have to have. You don't have to have uh, any level of understanding. You don't even have to, you know, look as good as me to be able to share the gospel. That's a joke, okay? It's a joke. It's a privilege to be able to share the good news. And it is my hope that all of those of you who belong to Christ will embrace this honor and you will dedicate yourself to understanding all of the pieces of the gospel in such a way that when the Lord calls on you to be able to explain it, you will be ready. All of the pieces of the gospel, like a puzzle, are necessary in order to create the full picture of God's message to the world. When we have a few of these pieces missing, it can create misunderstanding of God's character, of God's plan, and our place in God's plan. But as the full and complete picture comes into view, it gives us an overwhelming appreciation of who God is and all of the awesome things He has done for us. And we've been studying in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul gives us some key pieces of the gospel message. And we're going to look at three of those this morning. In Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, we find out that God qualified you. He qualified you. This is the first piece that we're going to take a look at. Verse 12, Paul says that the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. Now, a father 
an earthly father shares what is his with the members of his family. And in order to share in the inheritance of that family, you have to be a member. It's as simple as that. You have to belong. And likewise, with our Heavenly Father, you have to belong to His family as His child. This place takes place through what the Bible calls spiritual adoption. In the same way that a child who is adopted does not adopt themselves into a family, but rather is adopted by the family, it is their action that adopts the child. In the same way, it is the work of our Heavenly Father who adopts us into His family. We don't do the work of adopting ourselves. It is Christ and His power that adopts us. You can't qualify yourself for God's family. Not one thing you can do can make you good enough or can transfer you into His family. It is the work of God Himself. And He has done this through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This work is what we call his grace or his gift to us. Our work in this process is nothing at all. We simply say, yes, Lord. We put our faith in him. Now, the reason we need to be qualified for God's family is because prior to spiritual adoption, every human being belongs to a different spiritual family. When you were born, you belonged to a different spiritual family. God's spiritual family may have some dysfunction that goes on for a time being before heaven. But the other spiritual family's dysfunction is in the extreme. Now, Paul describes this extreme dysfunction in his book to the Ephesians. And I wanted to read this for you. It's a few verses. But I wanted to give you just a snapshot of how dysfunctional, how bad it is to be a part of the other spiritual family. Verse 1, chapter 2 of Ephesians. He says, You were dead in your trespasses in sin. Well, that doesn't sound good. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Well, that doesn't sound good either. Following the spirit of disobedience, that's Satan. So that was what you were uh, were born into as a human being. Um, And it says, among whom we've all lived in the passions of our flesh. Now, I've been in church long enough to know that passions of our flesh is not good. That's not a good thing, okay? That's to stay away from. But I want to pray for us now. Lord God, I want to ask that you would pull down this fear that has surrounded your people, not only our church, but the church of Jesus Christ around the world of sharing the good news. The good news is the, the gospel of salvation. It is the power of God for salvation for all who believe, Father. And we confess that we have been a part of those who have embraced fear instead of walking in faith in this, God. Would you break the fear off of us? We're asking for it, Lord, because we know that it's you who does this work, and so we're asking you to break the fear off of us so that we can be a part of this tremendous, tremendous ministry of sharing the good news so that people can hear and they can respond and they can become part of your family too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Jesus, Jesus has taken... On all of our debt, Colossians 1.22 says, in the body of his flesh. And the payment of the debt had to be his life because he was redeeming your life, a life for a life. He could qualify you because he took care of all of the qualifications you needed to become a part of his kingdom and his family. That's the first piece. The second piece is that he reconciled you. Colossians 1, 22 through 20, uh, 21 through 22 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. You know what it says there? It says you needed to be reconciled. You needed help. It says that you were an alien. That's what it says right here. You were alienated. You were an alien to God. You were an enemy of God. You were hostile. When God wanted to approach you, you said, get away from me. That's the default mindset that we have been born into. But when Christ comes, 
our hearts are turned around. Now, you might be thinking, you know what, Pastor Nate, I wasn't hostile to God. You see, I've been in church all my life. I've, I've always wanted to follow God. I've always wanted to do what God wanted me to do. That I've, I'm not hostile. I don't, I don't get this. We talked about being deceived earlier, right? Church people learn the fine art of uh, being passive aggressive. Do you all know this? You see, because it's not acceptable to be rebellious or to look like you're rebellious in church, or rebellious against God, right? And so church people learn the, the fine art of looking good while in the inside being rebellious. You know the story of the kid, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. You remember that? Yeah? We learn the fine art of rebelling and kind of hiding it so nobody else can see. But you know what? God can see it. And the truth of the matter is that we are born into a disposition that is hostile towards God. And because of that, that, you know, as we talked about, we're under God's wrath. From time to time, even the best friendships and family relationships, we go through times of hostility where reconciliation is needed. Now, sometimes reconciliation can be as simple as an apology and an offer of forgiveness. We used to teach our kids to say the words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then the response would be, I forgive you. Now, that's difficult enough for kids to say, right? We had to really encourage our kids along the way to do that. But if you're not used to that as a kid, it's nearly impossible as an adult to say the words out of your mouth, I'm sorry, right? It's almost impossible. And only through Christ's work in our hearts can we begin to understand this ministry of reconciliation. See, the world works on this way. Let's just not rock the boat. But God wants us to be those who are reconciled because he wants us to be reconciled to him. He wants us not to be hostile to him anymore, to be alienated. He wants us to have peace with him. When it comes to reconciliation, we human beings are really concerned about who is right and who is wrong. Have you ever thought about that? Somebody has done something wrong and we say, it's not my fault, it's their fault, right? We're really concerned But think about it from God's perspective. I was thinking about it this way. From God's perspective, from heaven, he's looking down on two human beings that are at odds with each other. They're not at peace. They're not reconciled. He looks down and he says, well, you guys are both wrong all the time. I mean, think about this, right? From God's perspective, he sees human beings. And so in any situation, guaranteed, you have opportunity to say, I'm sorry, because I can be willing to bet that you got something that you've done wrong in a relationship, every relationship that you have. But human beings, we like to be right. From his perspective, from God's perspective as a judge of the universe, he could throw us all in the slammer. So I don't believe that God is so concerned about who is right and who is wrong as he is with whether or not we love each other and have the courage to say, I'm sorry, to courage to say, I forgive you. You see, God is in the reconciliation business. But until we realize that we are the one who needs to say that we're sorry, until we realize that we're the one in the wrong, that we're the one that's hostile towards God, then we will not seek for reconciliation. We will seek for our own justification. But once we turn to him in humility and ask for forgiveness, he then is able to take away the barriers that we ourselves have built up between him and us. Now, isn't that cool? Then we don't have to feel guilt or shame because of what we've done because he has torn it down and he has destroyed the barrier, the wall of separation that exists between the two of us. He has removed the kind of relationship with him that has been built on the foundation of guilt and shame and instead given us a new basis for a relationship with him, one that is built on complete trust and dependence, just like the relationship that a good father has with his children. And so he has adopted us into his family. He's qualified us to be in his family. He has also then reconciled us. We have a good relationship with him, not one that is based on guilt and shame. And let me just say this morning, if when you think about your relationship with the Lord, if there are areas in your relationship with him that you um, uh, would say that guilt and shame um, kind of dictate how you relate to him, 
I want to say that this piece of the gospel is good, the good news that you need to have. Because your relationship with him, what he wants for you, is to not have guilt and to not have shame concerning your relationship with him. He wants that all to be freed. He wants to understand that he wants to reconcile you so that you have the best relationship with him possible. You need to know this morning that God is the one who reconciles you. Now there's a third piece of the gospel Paul talks about, and that's that he presented you. God presented you. Colossians 1, 22 says to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now holy means 100% pure, nothing wrong, no imperfections at all. Blameless means not being at fault for anything. Above reproach means there's no need for anything to be correct, corrected. Now understand this, only a pure and holy God can present sinful people as holy, blameless, and above reproach. Only one who is perfect in every way has the authority and the ability to do that. This is a status which God gives to all who trust Christ alone for redemption, as we've already talked about this morning. But then, in our passage, Paul goes on to say something weird. Listen to this, okay? Paul says, to present you holy and the blameless and above reproach before him, if you indeed continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. Now, wait a minute. This seems to go against everything that we've talked about. What gives, Paul? Why is there a conditional statement in here? If you continue to, uh, in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. What, what's going on here, Paul? So let me, let me talk just briefly about the gospel, the message of salvation through Christ alone that gives hope for this life and for the afterlife. It gives us hope not in the way that the world around us understands hope because the current understanding of hope is sort of like, I hope so. There's no assurance of it. Well, I, I hope I'm going to get a good grade on the test. Well, you don't have any assurance that you're going to get a good grade. You kind of roll the dice and, well, if I get a good grade, that's good. If I don't, okay. That's the nature of I hope so. But the hope that we have that Scripture talks about is as sure and solid as God's promises which never fail to come to reality. Now, Jesus said this in John 10, 35, that Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. Uh, that means that when God says it, it always comes to pass. If God says it, He has the power and He has the ability to make sure that it happens. When in Scripture, God predicted that Jesus would die on the cross, that's exactly what happened. And there are, throughout the Old Testament, before Christ appeared on the earth, so many uh, scriptures that reference him dying for the salvation of mankind that, that we understand that when God says it, through that alone, that he can bring it to pass. Now, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, you must also believe these words that he says, that scripture cannot be broken. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then you also have to believe that every word that he says in the scripture is true and must come to pass. You can't believe one without the other. How can you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, where does that happen, right? And not believe the one who said it was going to happen. And so when we put our hope in Christ, when we say that we have hope in the gospel that we have heard, it is not a, I hope so, I hope that the good news will, will uh, um, work for me. It is a confident assurance that what God says will exactly come to pass. Now, many in this world struggle with the fear that they will lose their salvation or they can't know for sure whether they'll be with the Lord when they die. They believe when you strip away all the outer ideas in their head and get to the heart that their status with God depends on how good a Christian they are or how good a person they are. So when a conditional statement like this comes up in Scripture, if you continue in the faith, they immediately read into it based on their fears. And this is kind of how it goes in their their head. Oh no, will God still love me because I've been a bad person? He won't want to be around me because I've done so many wrong things. And certainly the good Christians 
won't want anything to do with me because they're so holy. Yeah, right. They probably are just being nice to me, but I don't deserve all of the bad, I, I deserve all the bad things that will happen to me. And this is the way that the thinking goes. Although what happens when they die might not be something they think about very often, when, when they do think about it, they would say something like this, I hope I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'm not really sure because I don't know if I've been a good enough person. Now this thinking, as I talk with people and I ask people, if you were to die, why would you go to heaven? I get this answer all the time. This is not, oh, something that's in a corner somewhere that a few people believe. This is consistent with so many people's belief today in 2018. This is the hope that people hold on to. And I'm telling you from the scripture, this is no hope at all. But you see, we who have heard the gospel, we have a sure hope that we can hold on to, that we know is going to come to pass because the one who gave it is faithful. We can hold on to it and it's something that we can share with other people. The gospel pieces that we have talked about this morning all point to God's ability instead of human ability. Now our scripture memory verse for this month is Philippians 2.13. It is God who works in you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. And this is why I've been praying, Lord, may the things that please you be pleasing to me as well. The hope that we have in the gospel is not based on our own work, but on the work of God. So here's my charge to you this morning based on the truth of the scripture that we've heard. My charge to you is to come fully out of the darkness of insecurity in your relationship with the Lord and into the light of full security in what Christ has done for you. My charge to you this morning is to come fully out of the darkness of religious duty and into the light of a fully reconciled relationship with Jesus Christ. Now I'll say, just I, I think some of you might need to let go and to let God in your life. You've been given perhaps a moral and religious upbringing, but if you ask yourself why you do good things, is it out of a sense of duty? Is it because you're working really hard at not sinning? Is it because you get a sense of satisfaction that other people look up to you because you're a good person? Is there some, some satisfaction that other people know that you are a righteous or a good person? All of these reasons may be good in human ways of thinking, but they're not God ways of thinking. Our reason for being good according to God's kingdom is because deep in our hearts we have an undying love for the Lord. It is because we know in our hearts that nothing is better than Him, that nothing is greater than God, that nothing is more beautiful than Him, that nothing compares to Him. It's because the Holy Spirit of God has made a deposit in our heart that what brings us the greatest joy and the pleasure are the things that bring God joy and pleasure. See, all of our hope needs to be in Jesus and our relationship with Him that comes by faith alone through His grace alone. The difference between a reconciled relationship with Jesus and a relationship that is based on religious duty is massive. The two are irreconcilable. The difference is not small. The difference between them is the difference between being with the Lord forever and not being with the Lord forever. And so this message of Christ is good news for everyone because religious duty is a burden that no human being is able to carry. So my charge to you is to let go of that and today to hold on to the true pieces of the gospel that God has worked in you. He has, he has adopted you into his family, right? He has presented you as holy and blameless. He has reconciled you to himself. All of this is the work of God and we need to embrace as, as those who have received the gospel message, we need to receive into our hearts, these truths of the gospel message, not only to be able to receive them, but also to be able to share them with those whom God has brought into our lives. And so this morning as we finish with uh, this section in, in Colossians chapter 1, um, may God's words penetrate our hearts and may His Holy Spirit work in us to understand and to know the gospel and then to know Him more as well. So let me pray to that end. Father, I give you the thanks for your word that accomplishes what you intend it to accomplish. 
Father, I thank you that not one word that you say won't accomplish its purpose, not even one. So I thank you, God, that, that you are working in us both to want to do your will and to carry it out as well as we read in Philippians 2.13. So Lord, let these pieces of the gospel, let these parts of the understanding that we need penetrate us, Lord, that become a part of the fabric of our lives. And Lord, continue to work in us for your glory and honor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our final hymn, Redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me shall continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guards every footstep and gives me a song in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. A loving Heavenly Father invites us to be a part of his family forever. Now that is a good deal. So... Hold that with you, and uh, as you walk through this week, remember, you're his child, and he loves you, and I do too. Have a great rest of your Sabbath day.